Great. So, hi, Rob. Good to see hey. you. Hey, Irene. Um, so today we're interviewing Rob Dale Media um, about Marine Explorer and also about PIDAP. And right now, Rob is the um, Ocean Data Engineer. Is that the right title? Yep. At Marine Explorer. So I don't know, Rob, if you want to add any more introduction or background about who you are, where you came uh, from. Uh, yeah, well, thanks for having me here first. Uh, well, um, so I, like you said, uh, my name is Roberto de Almeida. Uh, I work for Marine Explorer. And the reason I came here to the US is I have a degree in oceanology and a PhD in physical oceanography. So I've been doing uh, research most uh, all my adult life. And, but at the same time, uh, I always felt that the way we work with data and science is, is inefficient and, and time wastes a lot of time. So for the past 10 years, I've been developing a lot of uh, open source software that tries to improve that. Um, so I have uh, written um, PyDAP, as you said, and, and other libraries that try to improve that situation. And uh, yeah, last year, so I joined Marine Explorer because it's one place where I can do both, I think. I can work with ocean data, which is what I like to do. Nice. So with that background, one of the, the ESIP tagline is making data matter. And you said a little bit about that just in your intro, but um, what do you think the benefits are to making data matter? I mean, you guys have a lot of data for with Marine Explorer, and um, so I don't know, maybe why that's important and what are the implications? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so um, our estimate is that we spend around 80% of the time uh, just uh, collecting data, downloading data. And um, last year I was at the uh, EarthCube uh, meeting and we did the word tag of everybody, everything everybody was talking about. Mm -hmm. And the biggest word that would stand out like just a, giant over all the other words is data. And oh, of course it was a, a data meeting, but what I would like to see is, is making data more invisible so we don't have to worry about, oh, I need to get this data and I need to find it and then I'm going to download and then I need to discover, I mean, how I'm going to read this data, how I'm going to convert this data to something that I can start working on. So we would like people to just have an idea and like, oh, I, I would like to see, I mean, what is the ter temperature in the uh, tropical Atlantic right now, and they can just like open their their favorite application. They like to work with MATLAB or or Ferret or Python, and they can just like jump in the data and connect to um, to a repository where they they don't need to worry about all these details and can just start um, doing their research and, and doing their science. So this is what we're trying to do. Is uh, uh, Marine Explorer? We're aggregating all the our goal is to aggregate all the public ocean data that we can find. So you don't need to go to, to all different websites. You don't need to know who is measuring some data that are at, at a specific location that you're interested in. You can just go, well, I'm, I'm interested in the Mediterranean Sea. Who's mm -hmm. measuring what here? And then we're going to show, well, we have all this data here. And since we aggregate the data, it's not metadata index, but we actually have all the data. We have the data normalized, so everything is in the same units. Mm -hmm. um, same convention, so you can just, well, I want this region, I want this uh, time range, and I want these variables, and you can just go directly into the data. We actually want to make data matter less. We want to make the science matter. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, making data matter less. Well, the jobs. Uh, yeah. Science, but science mattering more, and I think that that's really a good point about all of the redundant work that we all do to get the data into a format that we can find and access and use and understand and finally, you know, the last 20% or the last 5% get to science. Mm -hmm. um, so with all of that ocean data, um, would you say that it's a big data problem that Marine Explorer is tackling? Um, do you think that you're, or you're are you able to do the kind of big data analytics? Um, and by that, I'm thinking of you know usage patterns and people that use this also use that. Um, but you know other big data implications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. 
And I mean, we call ourselves the first uh, big data platform for ocean data. And I mean, the tools the, the tools we use uh, are very similar to what everybody's using for I don't know other kind of data, bank data, or mm -hmm. um, or tweets or anything. And so we're doing real-time stream. So it could be just a real, real-time stream of tweets about, uh, um, I don't know, uh, hurricane. Yeah. And, and, but in our case, it's ocean data. And we have um, uh, our pipeline is pretty much, uh, well, it's, of course, it's tailored to geospatial data. We have geospatial and temporal data that we need to um, uh, I mean, specific handling of the data, but in in, in essence, uh, data is data. Right. And so, uh, yeah, there, it's I mean, yeah. So it's it's big data, and there's no difference between I think scientific data or any other kind of data. It's it's more how you apply the data than than anything else. Yes, yeah, so that was my next question. Do you think there's a difference between big data and science data? Um, do you in the, on the marine explorer side let people? Um, export data in different, like whatever format, you know, HDF, uh -huh. KML, whatever their preferred CSV, Excel. Well, um, or do you mostly uh, use it on the Marine Explorer platform. Uh, yeah, right now, um, what we offer is. Uh, you can so you can you. It's basically right now what we have at MarineExplorer.org is a data set builder. You can combine whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And you create a custom data set that you can share with other colleagues, or you can mm -hmm. download. Um, if you download, it's uh, an etcdf file with a CSV file. So we have a difference in the system. We have uh, gridded data from satellites or models, and we have uh, station data um, mm -hmm. from buoys or stations or ship. and Station data comes as a CSV file, and the grid data comes as an etcdf file. And then you also get all the associated metadata. So we combine all the metadata from the different sources together also in an XML file, multiple XML files. So you get a zip file. Mm -hmm. And we want to improve that experience. Uh, and one thing we do is we offer an open app access to the mm -hmm. data set. So once you created, created your data set, you uh, can simply you get a URL for your data set, so you can also share that. And uh, with OpenDAB, you can get your 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 application. You can do it on MATLAB. You can do it in R or IDL, Python, Ferret, Grads, many applications. Yeah. You just uh, plug in the URL, and your application will access the data directly. Hmm. So you don't need to worry about downloading the zip file, unzipping. And then you need to see, oh, I have some data in etcdf, I have some data in CSV, I have some data in. Um, yeah. So we think it's, I mean, we could offer, like I said, downloads in multiple form formats. And we have on the, pipe on, on the pipeline to offer MATLAB downloads or HDF5 uh, yep. downloads. But uh, I might have a bias because I've been working with PyDev. But I think that having <laughs> open app access is, is um, better because you don't need to worry about the file format. Right. No, I think that that's um, definitely an advantage of OpenDAP and um, of that that way of interacting. You know, the other, I guess, alternative would be you know, OpenDAP is, I guess, this to an extent, but, you know, service-oriented, but I'm thinking OGC services of giving people, you know, a WCS or a WFS for mm -hmm. um, tracks or sensor observation services, something like mm -hmm. that. But yeah, I think OpenDAP lets you do that, too. Um, yeah, yeah. So what else do I want to know? Um, I guess I want to talk a little bit about collaboration and how you found one of the things that was really interesting talking to Andrew Collette was his explanation of the development of H5Pi and how that was sort of a community um, product. You know, it was funny because he was like, you know, I didn't actually create all of H5Pi. And I wonder what your experience working in the Python community has been like and, um, you know, the pluses and minuses of collaborative uh, programming and then maybe, you know, if you've been able to carry any of that over into science. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so um, that's actually what 
uh, drove me to programming in Python. Um, I started using Linux um, 15 years ago. And being a scientist and looking at how science was developed and how open source software was developed, I was, I was so jealous because Mm -hmm. I would look at this community and everybody was sharing ideas and sharing thoughts and blogging about uh, uh, their ideas and just working on things uh, uh, like on the internet. I, I saw the Atom specification when, when they were thinking about replacing RSS, so the Atom specification just kind of grew out the internet. People were discussing on blogs and everybody could um, uh, just join and, and start a discussion. It was very um, meritocratic. And yeah. everybody like sharing their code, sharing their ideas. And in science, I mean, I had trouble sharing uh, knowledge with people from um, like across the hall. I would yeah. go there and, and ask, hey, I need to do this. I, I saw you, you did it on another paper. And people were very sec secretive and like, eh, um, I'm not comfortable sharing my code. And I'm not, uh, OK, if you put my, my name on your paper, I'll do that. And uh, I, I once heard this quote from uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, he said, there's no limit uh, to the amount of good you can do if you don't take who, ta who takes the credit. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that's a little bit how open source works. People are more like, uh, it's, it, I mean, of course, we need the credit because if you can work without, without getting the credit, it's, 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 it's the best, I think. But in yeah. the end, we have careers, and especially if you're an academic, you need to have credit for what you've done so you can get tenure and, and, and all that, uh, that stuff. Uh, but I think the problem with science is science is like a race. So only who finishes first gets the credit. It doesn't matter how well you run. It doesn't matter uh, anything else in, in, from start to in the beginning. It's all about the end. So if you publish first, credits, credit is yours. If you share an idea, uh, you don't get any credit. I mean, okay, you yeah. might uh, get an acknowledgement, but in practice for your career, you get no credit. If you share data, especially in oceanography, it's really expensive to go to the sea. You need to work really hard. You're going to be one month uh, away from your family, working, mm -hmm. I don't know, sometimes 18 hours a day to get mm -hmm. some data. And then, of course, uh, you don't want to give that away because uh, people are going to publish and they're going to get all the credit, and you're just a data provider. Yeah. Uh, so. It's That's a really good point. I mean, I hadn't. I worked in air quality, so a lot of my data was coming from satellites and sort of unmanned surface observation use sensors. And it wasn't that time away from family, the big commitment that ocean data, getting ocean data, could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I understand that people want to hold into the data and hold into their ideas, and because. A lot of people will only talk about ideas they've published, so they only give a talk if they publish something. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you have an idea and you talk about it, it of course it's going to be much more. more uh, uh, it's going to be better for everybody for science. You, you get earlier discussions and uh, you can get a much better result. So I think we need to rethink how people get credit. So people should get more credit for publishing data sets, mm -hmm. for blogging about ideas, and and for doing other stuff than just publishing. Nice. Um, so I think maybe my last um, my last question is going to get to PIDAP and um, specifically Garrett Hebert at HDF gave me this question and he wanted to know about it in terms of H5 Pi, but I think it might still be applicable um, with PyDAP too. About and the quote comes from the C++ programming language book um, by linguist V. L. Worf, and he says that language shapes the way that we think and determines what we think about. And so the question is, does Python? Um, how does Python shape the way that you think about OpenDAP or DAP? Um, and in creating PyDAP. Um, or science data in general. We can come back to that second part. But did mm -hmm. it sh did the Python language shape how you were creating PyDAP and interacting with OpenDAP? Yeah, very. Um, I think Python in, in particular, um, Python has something called the Zen of Python. It's a kind of Easter egg. You can, you can open any Python uh, interpreter, and if you type import this, enter, you get this little poem, which is called the Zen of Python. 
and which describes, I mean, the design uh, philosophy behind Python and how you should think about it. Mm -hmm. So it says, for example, that um, explicit is better than implicit. Mm -hmm. um, simple is better than complex, but complex is better than complicated. Um, flat uh -huh. is better than nested. And in the face of ambiguity, refuse the temptation to guess. So it gives you kind of a clear Zen mind state, how you should program and, and do simple things and do beautiful things. And, um, and I think that a lot of that applies into science also. So in the face of ambiguity, refuse the temptation to guess. And, and yeah. Simple is better than complex. And so... And if it has to be complex, don't make it complicated. I mean, I think yeah. that that... Yeah, those are really... I, I was immediately seeing that connection. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's beautiful. And well, while developing PyDAP, I had, uh, had that in mind. Uh, I've been programming in Python for, for a long time right now. Oh, but PyDAP is more than 10 years old, so mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, at least that. And when you start, re uh, the, the nice thing about Python also has, on the Zen of Python has, uh, there should be one way to do it, well, preferably one way to do it. So we tend to, people who write Python code, you tend to write things in using the same, um, same logic and the same ideas. So you have this nice benefit that if you're going to read someone else's code, it looks like your own. You can quickly jump inside and you know, okay, when it's good Python code and when you write good Python code, you you, you can just dive in and it feels like it's your, mm -hmm. your own code. Mm -hmm. And so for for PyDAP, uh, right now I'm, I'm uh, just that that parallel too of if you write good Python code, you can jump into somebody else's code like it's your own. I mean, that yeah. should be the same for science data, too, just another. Yeah, 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 so, so th that's, that's why I love Python. That's why I'm, I've, I've been, I, can, I use it for everything. Yeah. And I wish we could bring, I mean, I hope that I can bring more, more from that into science. So while developing PyDAP, and of course I was learning, that's how I learned Python. I mean, I, was, I started with PyDAP, I, was, I barely knew Python, and it was a process where I was, in, I was falling in love, so the more I, the more I read about Python or studied Python, the more I would fall in love, and then I would want to read more. So in the beginning, yeah. it was a positive spiral. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so of course, the first version, first first version of PyDev was terrible. I had no experience. I was, I, I was just, hey guys, this is PyDev 1.0, and it doesn't work really well, but it does what I need to do. And that's a nice yeah. nice thing about Python. Also, you can do a prototype right, in, in one afternoon. Yeah. So I, I sat there, I was like, oh, I need to do this. I, in one afternoon, I had something that worked. And then it gives you the necessary encouragement to continue developing. It's not like you need to do one month of work, and then you're going to get, uh, you're going to leave it because you need to do your real work, and then you're just going to put it aside, and you're never going to uh, finish it. Yeah. But with, with Python, you can get started, and you get a, a short feedback cycle. Mm -hmm. So as I have maybe four major releases of PyDev uh, in, in, the, in these uh, last ten years, and was it mostly you doing the development, or did you have were there people contributing? Well, there were a few uh, contributors. Uh, some people sent, and this is when you get hooked. I mean, when people started, hey, this is nice. Here's a yeah. patch that improves it, or here's I did something else, and. And that's when, when you, you're hooked. <laughs> that's the part I think would be thrilling, you know, when you yeah. get that first, you know, person that says, like, I saw this, and then I saw this part that I wanted to fix, and here's a patch, and feeding it back into the... Yeah, you know. and like, one, one day I got a patch from NASA, they're like, hey, here's this patch from NASA, JPL, and I was like, whoa, this whoa. is... <laughs> this is... <laughs> I mean, it's a patch, I mean, it was not a bug, it was like an improvement, yeah. but, uh, so I was happy. But even if it were a bug fix, I would be happy. Be happy. Yeah, no, that's big time. Mom, look, somebody from JPL sent me a patch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so one nice thing is with each release, the code gets actually smaller. I could improve it, I, and I could rethink everything, and then, oh. okay, let's do it this simpler way. Let's not make it complicated. And then you start actually reducing the, the size of the code. You can get to the bare essential abstractions that you need. And so yeah, so yeah, so Python has a lot with uh, with how PyDAP ended, and and what I try to do with PyDAP is what I told you about the data being visible. So mm -hmm. you have data on an OpenDAP server, and I want you to know about PyDAP only on the first line of your code when you say, "Hey, I'm going to use PyDAP to access this data," 
and all the rest, you should be thinking in Python. So you should work with the data. Because the beauty of OpenNet is that you can access a huge data set on the, on the server, and you actually get kind of a very light representation on you, on your computer, which can be on, on MATLAB or on Python, and you don't actually download all the data, right? Mm -hmm. So when you connect right. to OpenMap, you get all only the metadata that describes your data set, but the user has the impression that he has the whole thing in his machine, and right. when you say, well, now I want to plot temperature on San Francisco for the month of January, then the libraries or PyDeb or whatever your system you're using, they will download that specific data that you want to see and they will download on the fly, and since usually you just want a subset of the data, it will be fast, and then you can, you have the impression that you're working with the huge data set on your machine when it's actually streaming the data as you need it. And yeah. this is what I try to do with PyDAP, so you load it, and then you need, I don't want you to worry about OpenDAP or know how the DAP uh, specification is, I just want you to, yeah. hey, work with this, and I'll give you the data whenever you need it, and just work as if it were any other Python uh, object. So are you, I don't know a ton about Python, but once you've called the data set with PyDAP um, and then you start working with it, um, you know, in Python, then you can do all sorts of manipulation, visualization stuff using using Python? Yeah, So you yeah. could chart it. You could, you know, do analysis on the data, some kind of computational services. That yeah, kind of thing. you can do anything, and it wouldn't be different than doing analysis on data that was on your disk or was in a mm -hmm. database. So, but, but like I said, the data is just streamed on the network as it's needed. So it's very efficient, and, and you don't need to learn anything new. That's, that's what I think it's the strength of OpenNet. It's just yeah. do whatever you want, except your data will be on the server, and it's going to be fetched for you as, right. as it's needed. Yeah, which actually I think is the strength of OpenNet that even... In WCS, there's a limitation to how much you can get at one time. Yeah. Um, and this idea of streaming, you know, and that you don't really worry about where the data is, I think, is a real strength. Yeah. I mean, open that, depending on the server, you can have limitations like that because you might have billions of records uh, for some data. And, mm -hmm. I mean, in that case, usually the server would limit, oh, you can only, get, they would say you can only get 10,000 at a time. Yeah. So you would need to, and yeah, this is a case where the abstraction leaks and you need to know about the specification or how the server works because you need to know, okay, I requested, but it only gave me 10,000. Now I need to do a different request because I yeah. need additional 10,000. This is the kind of thing I try to avoid because uh, I want to make data invisible. I want to make people not learn about open that. And well, yeah. I want to make it just work. Do science. Do you have any idea if people are using PyDAP for things beyond Earth science? Uh, yeah, they, they are, yeah, there are some weird <laughs> use cases, weird for me, but, uh, <laughs> so people, I've seen people using the server to have, like, um, DNA data, like the genome uh, oh. sequencing uh -huh. data, and also for, uh, like, mechanical engineers for modeling structures, so they have all the yeah, data yeah. they need, and, and the thing with PyDAP is, I don't, I actually don't get a lot of feedback, uh, uh, I mean, the code has been developing for, for I've been developing for ten years. It's it's pretty much stable. So, yeah. it and it, I mean the specification is hasn't changed. I mean that that four is coming, so I'm going to do some changes. But the current specification has been the same for also fifteen years. So yeah. it's it's pretty stable. People download, they use it, it works, and they never like let me know. I mean I know it has like yeah it works hundreds of thousand downloads. Whoa. And, yeah, but I get maybe five emails a month on a busy month or something. Wow. Yeah, so it's stable. You know, I think that there's there's the life cycle curves, and once things have, you know, reached maturity, there may not be, a, you know, a lot of reason to give feedback. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. we know that you're a celebrity in the open app <laughs> and yeah. the, uh, the HCF world. The Python world. Uh -huh. Somebody called you Python royalty. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so the last question, and I don't know if you've got anything or not. I know I said the last was the last, but um, so kind of going back to Marine Explorer, is there anything that the ESIP community should be on the lookout 
or in the next year or anything that you'd like community feedback on. Um, you know, they can add data, they can they can join. Um, maybe if you want to say a little more about what might be helpful from your side to have community input on. Yeah, so uh, like I said, our goal there is to have uh, all the, uh, the ocean data in the world. And that's a pretty um, ambitious goal. Uh, and, and the problem with data is you have a long tail distribution. So we can go for Argo data, and we can go for satellite data. That's that's mm -hmm. a big part of the curve. You get a lot of data quickly. Yep. But then you get this, this long tail where maybe more data is produced, uh, probably. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm sure more data is produced faster than we can can import it. Mm -hmm. And and the benefit of importing, I mean, you can do a lot of work, and you get just a little bit. So if you want to have that that long tail of data. We need to um, we need to have the community helping us, mm -hmm. and that's why we we created marineexplore.org, and we offer public data for free. We want to create a community where people are 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 discussing and sharing and, and collaborating around data, sharing early ideas, sharing early mm -hmm. topics, and sharing data sets that they they've created. And so we want people to publish their data to marineexplore.org. Um, because they want to have a backup, because they want to have it online. A lot of people don't have data online, yeah. because they want to have it, or make it have a, uh, a, um, more uh, more outreach. And so, so we need a community to publish their data to marineexplore.org, so so we can have all that data. And I think that I mean we talk a lot about big data, and I recently started a discussion on LinkedIn. And there, I have an ocean data group there, and I think little data. Which is the long tail? It's like those yeah, yeah. maybe I don't know 100 kilobytes of data that are sitting in some computer in some lab, but right. they are measurements that were made in a particular spot of the ocean in a particular day, and we can never go back and measure that again. I mean, that's it. That's right. what we have, and we cannot travel back in time and measure that again. So I think the little data is as important as as the big data, or even more important. I think uh, yeah. we should definitely go for that. And that's why we're trying to create this community and get people engaged because we know we cannot do it alone. And I think everybody will, will benefit from this. It's going to be amazing. And then, like I said, then when we have all the ocean data of the world in one place, that's that's uh -huh. when the fun begins. All right, that's when we can start doing crazy stuff and and just uh, yeah, yeah. The kinds, I think that's the next for me. The the interesting thing to see about this community as they start sharing data and that becomes more of the norm. What are the new questions that you can answer that you know you yeah. never would have been able to answer alone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I usually get that 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 sense when I'm uh, usually writing blog posts for Marine Explorer, and mm -hmm. uh, what I try to do is like combine different data sets, and it's always nice when you want to do something. I can get this data set that's completely unrelated to this other data set, and I can just. They're, uh, they're just combined there. They're just there, and I can just do some analysis or do something. That's when I, I feel the power of the platform we're building. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. So thanks so much for talking to me today. And if people wanted to reach you, I'm going to try to be fancy now. And uh, <laughs> maybe you can do it on yours in the lower third. Put your email. Oh, yeah, let me do that. Yeah. Um, and where you are on Twitter and the ways that they can connect with you because as soon as I put out the call for ESIP innovators, your name came right back, so I know that they're interested. I'm going to put my email and my Twitter. Uh, we should just say, you know, for the record, that this was our first, um, perfect, our first Google Hangout, my first Google Hangout using the, um, the streamer and the lower third, so... Hopefully people will be kind to us. Yeah, yeah, I think it was a good experience. Yeah, I, I like it. Yeah. Um, but I really appreciate you talking to me. I'm going to stop the broadcast. <laughs>